Jeg vesker denne felgrutt, øy til simpansium, ubi sim og hoglam dire, kommer et av hert. I am welcoming you with a non-existing language, hence one you could say is a simulation, compiled of two languages with some additional sources. Starting as a joke in the late hours yesterday at the Souk restaurant, in itself a near to perfect simulation of a North African caravaneria, I realized that this immediately raises a series of central questions regarding simulation. One question would be um, the relation between the simulation and the real world. Um, through our context, you probably could guess some of the meaning of my cryptic welcome. While the non-existing language refers to existing living languages, nevertheless, it generates something new. Um, this refers to the important role of simulation towards um, forecast towards the not yet existing. It also um, refers to simulation as uh, something generative and creative. Another question would be uh, simulation as something that takes place in all kind of forms, in all kind of forums, in everyday life as well as in research. Um, this week we brought a group of students from Norway and they participate in an extended workshop with the theme of simulation together with the students here. During that week, they have been exposed to Olafur Eliasson's installation at the Tate Gallery, um, which clearly refers to simulation as a weather system. They have been investigating the intriguing um, spaces of the Sons Museum, um, where illusion, and you could say somehow also simulation, is uh, at stake. They have heard uh, Dr. Jane Harris' lecture on textile simulation, and uh, yesterday the inter intermediate jury shedding light on a long line of uh, simulation-related aspects. The symposium today, somehow trying to top this week, intends to bring together the equally broad range of people to go deeper into the, this fantastic theme of simulation and to look at it in an interdisciplinary way. I will now give the word to Michael, and maybe he can, first of all, introduce our first lecturer, but also have, he has some words to say. We actually uh, had a bet going whether Birger would crack up using the word chimpanzium instead of symposium, but uh, he didn't, so I owe him something. When Birge first uh, wrote an email to Achim and I saying, should we not uh, organize a series of workshops and symposia in relation to the topic of simulation, I remember that my response was, yes, great, let's do it, what is it? Um, and ever since then, I'm trying to figure out exactly what it is, but obviously one starts by opening some books where and some uh, references where you may trust that you find interesting uh, stepping stones into a topic. And I would just like to read one sentence out of the Encyclopedia of Computer Science, where it's stated that uh, simulation is the process of representing the dynamic behavior of one system by the behavior of another system. The problem to be solved by simulation can be considered as the identification of the behavior of a dynamic system. Dynamic and simulation are interrelated terms. Now, it is certainly quite interesting to see that uh, the notion of dynamic, as in conditions uh, under development, uh, is a notion that is shared by very many different disciplines. And as one begins to look closer, one also soon sees that simulation as a method, uh, as a series of concepts and also related techniques and technologies of working and processing data with a certain purpose are imminent and increasing everywhere. However, one also quickly sees that um, there is a certain discourse between disciplines, but generally 
um, the method concept and uh, technology technique of simulation is pretty much scattered across the discipline and it's probably uh, quite interesting to start initially with the survey to see what is available. Obviously, one finds when starting looking around that um, from um, economics to medicine, from film and game industry to computer science to cognitive science, etc., etc., architecture and engineering not the least, all the design disciplines are somehow related um, with this topic and are working with methods of modeling, another related term to simulation. And so this first session is really a first inquiry, a first survey across disciplines, what is really taking place, how do people work with simulations, how do they look at simulations, what are the purposes. With the um, purpose to follow up this symposium in uh, fall this year to see whether the discourse now that is hopefully generated by this first symposium has led to some, um, uh, let's say, cross conversations between disciplines and hopefully also to um, uh, a kind of broader um, possibility to say what do we share uh, under these conceptions. And so today we have two sessions. Uh, we hope, at least so we simulated, we will have six speakers during the day, three in the morning and three in the afternoon, each session followed by a podium discussion. And uh, I will just now briefly introduce the first speaker of this morning and then we'll proceed uh, as announced on the schedule. Our first speaker this morning is Professor David Lane from the London School of Economics and Political Science. And uh, I actually have to read the name of his department. It is long, highly indicative, and uh, I think already somehow pointing in the direction of um, uh, the topic of today. The department is called Operational Research Department and Interdisciplinary Institute of Management. So. There is already a condition of interdisciplinarity, I think, which is very interesting in relation to the topic uh, that is at stake today. And uh, he is the reader in management science. Uh, when I first contacted him, I hope I'm not uh, already taking those things in advance uh, that you're going to say when I first contacted him, Professor Lane said, well, um, how, what do you actually expect from me uh, in that context of the discussion? And I could only admit that I um, approached him without any expectations, but with the hope that his presentation would lead us into some understanding of simulation that is as of yet somewhat foreign to a series of other disciplines, much as some of the uh, other speakers will present uh, working concepts of simulation which also seem equally foreign. So we just have to accept this condition of foreignness and uh, welcome it, embrace it. And uh, by having said that, I think I will pass the word on to Professor David Lane. of simulation. I'd be interested to know a little bit about you, first of all. Can you just raise your hands if you're from the United Kingdom? I've got one, thank you. Can you do that for me? Right. Okay. So. <laughs> right. Right. Now, let me take a wild guess here. Could, do you want to raise your hand if you're from, ooh, Norway? Right. Shout out the countries I've left out. Where are the rest of you from? Germany. Okay. Mexico. The Lebanon. Right. But where? Japan. Right. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. 
Right, that's just interesting to know. Okay. <laughs> right. <clears throat> I think that the image is being perfected. Yes, there we go. Right. <clears throat> well, um, this is what I'm going to talk to you about, and I'm sure it will seem very alien, and Michael's description of my reaction when I was first approached is, is, is absolutely correct. Um, I'm really not sure what I'm doing here. Now, this isn't that I want to tell you about my existential crisis, though I could. Um, it's that I'm not really quite sure how you're going to take this stuff. However, uh, I chatted with Michael on the telephone, and he explained that they were trying to understand, get a broad view of how different people use simulation. And as I look at the list of speakers today, um, I think you certainly are, and I think it's going to be an interesting world for, for all of us to immerse ourselves in. But this is going to be a, a, a transmission, a broadcast from a, an alien planet to a large extent. So really what I'm going to do this morning is talk to you in a spirit of experimentation. I'm going to show you what it is I'm interested in, what it is I do, why it works, when it works, how it works, to see if you're interested. Okay? Uh, I shall be, I must apologize in advance, I have to go this afternoon because from two till four I'm teaching this subject back at the LSE, so my apologies for that. Okay, <clears throat> let's just start. Can you, can you hear me and see the screen? Is everybody okay? All right, good. Right, we are interested in systems, as you will gather. Now, systems are tricky things. They don't behave the way we want them to. Whether we're talking about an organization, a government department, an entire country, your little office, any sort of set of things that connect with each other is a system in a sense, and they don't always behave the way we want them to and the way we expect them to. They behave in a counterintuitive fashion. They are tricky. Um, and yet we keep intervening in them and expecting them to do something that we can forecast or predict. Now, here is a chap who's decided he's rather crunched in, um, <clears throat> and he'd like some more space. So what he does is he intervenes in his system. Uh, he pulls a policy lever, if you like. He pushes down that wall, and he gets more space for a while. For a while, unfortunately, his intuition has failed him, and the system doesn't behave in the way that he expected because actually he's standing in one of these Stonehenge things. And it looks good at the moment, um, but what's going to happen is that these are going to topple round and round and round, and eventually he's going to get crushed. So this is called the better before worse behavior of the system over time. He gets more space for a while, and then considerably less space. This is not true. Let me tell you why. He doesn't success, ooh, somewhere when that block is falling, and you get his job, <laughs> which means that when this one falls on you, people go, what the hell is wrong with you? George was fantastic at this, this job. The department was great. That's why we promoted him. You walk in, and this is chaos. Now, we have created very complex systems, systems which are complex, systems which have cause and effect separated in space and time, and we all try to intervene in them. We all have what we call mental models of how systems work. And picking up the opening comments, we all attempt to mentally simulate those models. That is the basis of our action, unless that is we simply wander around the world acting randomly and capriciously. Most of us don't do that for a significant proportion of the time. But inter interacting with systems is quite hard. Our mental models are deficient, and we're not very good at mentally simulating them. And system dynamics is really about that. Now, this is a good point for you to decide, I don't want to listen anymore, OK? So 25 minutes snooze is fine, OK? I just thought I'd go up front and say, this is what I do. This is what I'm interested in. OK, so now the traditional content slide. I'm going to start off with a system story. I'm going to talk to you about what is system dynamics because I need to get some definitions clear, but I also want to show you what we do. But then also explicitly, I'm going to show you some examples of this systems technique in use, some maps, some models, and, uh, or a model and a micro world. 
and then I'm going to talk again about what system dynamics has to offer. Michael, I'd appreciate it if you told me when I had five minutes to go. Thank you. Okay, let's start off with a system story by talking about the system's perspective, the worldview that system dynamicists like me have. And it is this. As we wander through the ocean of life, we encounter icebergs, things that we can look at, find beautiful, find terrifying, avoid, or crunch into. These are the events that govern our lives, the things that happen every day, the piece of news that we heard on the radio this morning, what we read in the newspaper, the snapshot things that happen to us. System thinkers are interested in those, but they want to push deeper than those because they say, hang on, the world isn't just isolated events. Let's try to see what the context of that event is. What happened before that got us here? And what are the consequences of that event? Try to get, see the event in some kind of chronological, time-based context. In other words, looking below the water level, seeing what's there, and thinking there must be a pattern of behavior that this event is part of. But deeper than that even, what we are interested in is the system structure. This sounds very abstract. What we mean is the causal mechanism, what influences what in this system. And I will show you examples of that to get you used to the idea, if that seems unclear at the moment. Now, this is very abstract. So let me talk about a system story as an iceberg. Let's talk about events. And the events are something very normal. We're working for a little engineering firm, and we scratch our heads and we realize that in the last couple of months, Chris and Joe and Ralph all resigned. Yeah, because, you know, I knew Chris left because he's my friend, and I remember Joe, she went too, and I heard that this guy Ralph also went in the last couple of months. Now, they will all have gone for very particular individual reasons, being individual human beings. But is there a deeper pattern to this? Let's probe, let's look under the surface to a pattern of behavior. And when we look at the number of engineers in our company, we find that it's going downwards. There is an accelerating exodus of engineers in what we call a bot graph, a behavior over time graph. Hmm, interesting we go, interesting. Chris, Joe, and Ralph certainly made individual decisions, and yet there seems to be something deeper going on here. Okay. So let's go deeper. We need to go to another slide to go deeper. And what we find is this, that nine months ago, the budget for the whole organization was cut by 15%. That was put across the board, so the budget for our engineering group was cut, as a result of which we laid off some of our administrative assistants. Administrative assistants help us call up complex diagrams and indeed make minor changes to them, help us write reports or format reports and so forth. Generally speaking, help engineers stick to engineering. And we laid some of them off. That had a whole number of consequences. Laying off the administrative assistants increased the engineer's workload. Our workload didn't go down. That created stress amongst the engineers. That resulted in engineers leaving. That reduced further the number of project engineers. Is everybody with me? Are there questions? Okay. And that, of course, adds even more to the engineer's workload. This is called a feedback loop, or it's called the snowball effect. It's also called a vicious circle. We would say it's a reinforcing loop, right? or a positive feedback loop, and that begins to sound a bit technical. And the sort of people I work with don't like that kind of thing. This is a vicious circle, a reinforcing loop. It has a characteristic mode of behavior, which is exponential collapse or exponential growth. And that is exactly what we see here. This is the sort of phenomenon that we are interested in, one, understanding, two, intervening in to change. We're interested in explaining why what is happening is happening and intervening to make something different happen. And we do that by looking underneath the surface at the bottom of the iceberg because we think that is the place where you can intervene in organizations most effectively. Questions? It's just too weird. I'm just going to sit here quietly and let him carry on speaking. Right. <coughs> okay. What is system dynamics? Well, here's the guy who invented it, J.W. Forrester. There's what he says it is.
He published the core book of the field in 1961, and the subject was called Industrial Dynamics. Then in the mid-60s, uh, they just changed the name to System Dynamics, which sounded more general. This is his view of what System Dynamics was in 1961, uh, and it's pretty much his view today. That's a photo I took of him when I was visiting MIT, uh, which is the Sloan School of Management at MIT is where Jay is a professor. Now, so what we say in system dynamics is structure influences behavior. That's the iceberg lesson. This is the sort of thing that system dynamicists have on their t-shirts. Okay? Structure influences behavior. What we're saying is social systems, systems in which there are human decision makers collecting information and trying to steer the system in a certain way, can usefully be thought of as being made up of these vicious circles or virtuous circles, reinforcing loops, which make things bigger, and balancing loops, which try to equilibrate systems. So there on the left is a very conceptual view of what a system looks like. The point about that, the system structure, is that it is the interaction of those loops which causes behavior over time. Okay. Now, there are three key ideas or three key elements in system dynamics. Uh, and yes, I am going to show you examples of this kind of stuff, but I'm going to do it along the way. First of all, feedback thinking, simulation modeling, and engaging with the mental database. And I think maybe the third is going to be the most important one to emphasize with you here this morning, so I've tried to do that. Feedback thinking, well, you've just done some with uh, the story of Chris, Joanna, and Ralph. We just created a feedback diagram, a causal loop diagram. But feedback thinking, first of all, we write down the value of variable A, so engineers leaving influences the number of engineers that are left. Workload for engineers influences the stress that engineers feel. It's a very naked statement. It's a causal hypothesis. Okay? Sort of thing that David Hume would worry about endlessly. And Immanuel Kant, presumably. More than that, we want to go, okay, so A influences B, then what? Does it influence some other things? Are there long chains of consequence? Indeed, are there side effects? System dynamicists, by the way, don't believe in side effects. Right. There are no side effects. There are things that you make happen that you didn't expect to happen, but they're still effects. And most of all, we're interested in seeing whether this chain of causality loops back on itself, because that is the source of behavior in these systems. So feedback thinking, joined up thinking, some people call it. So there's that, mapping things out, which you can do with normal people on a piece of paper. Simulation modeling, when these maps get too complex, we have to resort to equations and parameters. I am now about deliberately to try to lose you, okay? Here is an example of the sort of models we build. You're gonna understand these in about 15 minutes, actually, but at the moment, that looks pretty tough. What you've got here is a very simple disease. It could be a cold, it could be something rather nastier, uh, like HIV. Um, You've got susceptibles, which I hope everybody in the room is, uh, infectives, people who have got it, and then what epidemiologists wonderfully call the removed class. Uh, the removed can be dead, but we wouldn't want to say that, um, or they can simply be immune. Okay. Um, that's a, that's a modeling formulation issue. Now, with something like that, you look at it and go, okay, so there's three loops, there's a reinforcing loop, there's two balancing loops. What's going to happen to susceptibles? Uh, susceptibles, uh, 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 bro. I don't know, will it all come down, uh, or uh, wobbly way, or will it all crunch down like that? Will it come down a bit? And not, uh, I don't know, I'm confused. I just don't know. Okay. Now, computer doesn't have that problem. You sit there, you specify this system fully and completely, and you get the answer to your question. Computer doesn't get bored, okay? It tells you that susceptibles will drop pretty low as the removed class moves up. There's a burst of infectives, but eventually everybody is removed. So if you want to think that this is the Black Death, everybody gets killed. Okay? And look with these parameters and this formulation. That's what you need when things get complex. Final component, engaging with the mental database. Let me go through each of these in turn. First of all, one of the most exciting features for me for system dynamics is that it gets the model builder out of the back office. Modeling is all too often done by rather sad, socially inadequate people in anoraks, right, who presumably in their time off do train spotting, 
right? I know I used to be that person, sort of, right? <clears throat> what you do is you get out there and you sit with your clients and say, how do you think this system works? Does this model represent how you think it works? You are accessing their mental database, eliciting their view of what's going on in the system. They are telling you, as she is doing, what to put in the model. Secondly, they can't just look at the model and go, hmm, that's interesting. They've got to stop and think about what that means. If we think that systems behave in a counterintuitive way, then we have to help people amend their intuition, which is what education is, essentially, building up intuition. Intuition is not this unchangeable thing that you have. Okay? You want to change people's intuition. And finally, you want them to agree, yeah, this is what we should do to get the system to behave in this way, to generate this kind of behavior. We're going to go off and we're going to do it. And there's a, a quite explicit kind of you know, emotional, personal commitment angle to doing this model building. Let me also compare system dynamics with some of the stuff that I think you're going to see later in the day. And I'm not going to criticize what's going to come later in the day. I simply want to position the system dynamics with, with respect to it. Let's imagine a very crude set of axes. Along the horizontal axis is the size or complexity of a model. Along the vertical axis is the value of that model. Now, the normal kind of view of modeling is the bigger the better. You know, a model is better, its value is better from a kind of technical plausibility point of view. The more you put in, the better it is. And that's, that's a, a, a modeling route which can serve you very, very well indeed if you're doing reservoir simulation for the oil industry, my old industry. And it can also go badly wrong if you're doing it with senior decision makers. What's the likelihood that people are going to look at a model, the value in that sense, the chance that your model will be looked at? Well, if you're doing it with other technical people, technical people will look at big models. But this is a graph for normal people. Okay? This is probably you, not me. But that remains to be seen. The chance of getting these people to look at a model and actually change their behavior, I think, drops away like this. <coughs> system, dynamics, system dynamics, therefore, tries to look at both of those things. It wants technical plausibility. It wants to build good models. But it wants them to get looked at. So kind of combining those two graphs, it has this view of what the value of a model is. You want, need a model of a decent size, but not so big, not so complex. And this is important to bear in mind when you see some other things. Let's stop from, Michael, when did I start? Or how much longer have I got? I've got another 20 minutes. That's lovely. Thank you. Right. Let me finish this section to be clear about what we're trying to do with system dynamics. We heard the word forecasting in the opening comments. System dynamics is not about forecasting. We use maps, qualitative maps, and models, quantitative models, and we are not after a solution, we're not after an optimum, we're not after a point forecast. We are after an understanding of why the system is doing what it does in general terms and what we need to do to make it do something different. And these are qualitative insights. They're qualitative insights about what are the best performance measures to monitor in the system? What are the leading indicators? What are the lagging indicators? Where should I look to understand what's happening? What are the policy levers to pull? Most people in organizations are confronted with a great row of policy levers. Which one do they pull? Should I tax? Should I spend? Should I expand? Should I buy more computers? Should I move offices? Whatever. Not only which lever, but which direction to pull it in. Sometimes systems are so counterintuitive that you should do the opposite of what you think you should do to get the effect that you want. System dynamics is about getting that kind of understanding. Okay, what I'm going to do now is show you some examples, but are there any questions so far? For those of you who didn't, after the first five minutes, go 25 minutes snooze for me, thank you. Okay, all right. Then let me show you some examples of mapping. Simple maps which will give you an idea of what this technique can tell you. <coughs> you will be aware that there have been issues in the United States of America, in Britain, in Germany, and some other countries about, political fund about funding of political parties by commercial organizations. Why do political parties do this? Well, it's perfectly rational activity. There is a desired party income up here. There is individual financial contributions to parties. 
which we know have been going down over the years. Interestingly, the number of people in the United Kingdom who are paid up members of a political party is less than one million, which I think is quite surprising. Why shouldn't it be 10 million, 20 million? It's less than one million. Okay, so your party income is less than your desired party income. As party income falls, pursuit of business funding goes up because you can get Bernie Eccleston to give you a million pounds, which is quite useful. Right? So there are business financial contributions to parties. This is a balancing loop. It brings party income up to desired party income. Perfectly rational. But there are some side effects that aren't side effects. This leads to the shaping of the political agenda by business interests. I should say, by the way, this, is, this model, that, as I am presenting it, is not mine. It is uh, a mapping out of the view uh, put forward by David Corton in his 1994 book, When Corporations Rule the World. So I'm trying to understand the coherence of his view. More financial contributions mean that the, the political agenda is increasingly shaped by business interests. That produces a reduction in the relevance of political discourse to individual citizens. Individuals become less involved in politics. As this goes down, this goes down. As individual involvement in politics goes down, individual financial contributions to parties goes down, which is where we started from. We got into this because individuals weren't giving money to parties anymore, and we took a course of action which seems to have strengthened that. Furthermore, there's another effect, which is as individual involvement in politics goes down, the shaping of the political agenda by individual citizens goes down. Now, what we have is round here, we have what's called a reinforcing loop, and, let's get it right, round here, we have a second reinforcing loop. Corton argues that this is why certain countries have got sucked into looking to commercial organisations for the funding of political parties. And you may be aware that Britain is now having a discussion about whether there should be state funding of political parties in order to reverse this. But this explains how what looks like a good policy can have deleterious effects because of other causal mechanisms in the system, according to David Corton. <clears throat> Let's look at a, another example. Uh, by the way, what this gives you is just insight, nothing more. Maybe that explains what I'm seeing out there in the world. Here's one which leads us to intervention. Uh, this is uh, some ideas from Geoffrey Pfeffer. He's a, a professor at Stanford. And a few years ago, 99, he wrote an article in Harvard Business Review. Uh, again, it doesn't have any system dynamics in it, but I mapped out his view. He is saying, reducing workers' wages is not always a good thing. And before you start cutting pay rates, pay per hour, think about what else might happen. His paper is essentially... Uh, it, it praises, the, praises um, high wages uh, for manufacturing workers. He says, okay, you have a desired total cost for your organization, you have an actual total cost. If total costs go up, you go for cost-cutting initiatives. Pay rates go down, labor costs go down, total costs go down. Balancing loop, trying to make total costs equal desired total costs. That's your mental model of what's going to happen in your organization. And it might be true. That might be the world you're sitting in. But what Pfeffer says is, you might be in a world where there's some other effects. Like, if you reduce pay rates, people are more, mo as pay rates go down, staff motivation moves in the opposite direction, which is what that means. They go and look for other jobs, which means staff turnover goes up, which in time means that the, st the stock of workforce knowledge goes down. Because if there is any skill needed in your job, those people who are walking out of the door are taking with them their experience, their time getting up the learning curve. That means you've got workers who are less productive. It takes them longer to achieve each individual task. And of course, labor costs is not just pay per hour. It's pay per hour times hours per task. That's a reinforcing loop. It says, actually, if you keep cutting your pay rates, you get less and less experienced people, so they take longer and longer and longer. This is, well, if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. Okay? Now, if that's the world you're in, cutting pay rates isn't going to work. But it could be worse than that. Because also, cutting your pay rates means your new recruits will not be as good. So again, 
the effective productivity goes down. Another reinforcing loop that could grab you. And Pfeffer now laying it on thick, it could be, of course, that there is a cost of poor quality work. Right? The microwave oven that's been assembled badly doesn't work. When a shop sells it, it doesn't work for you. You take it back to the shop. The shop brings it back to the manufacturer. There's cost there. Or worse yet, the microwave oven has been incorrectly wired uh, and it electrocutes you and kills you and your friends sue. Right? Um, somebody writing in the Observer commented that poor maintenance work and the British Rail Network over the last five years might have been, well, he observed, might have been a cause for some of the major crashes and hence accident claims that the railways have produced. Now, what does this tell us about what we would do if we were in this situation? We don't know that these other things are there, but we might worry that they are. <coughs> what it tells us is we might not want to cut pay rates, but if we do cut pay rates, we might, for example, want to monitor staff turnover for the first few months to see if it's going up monitor productivity. We might want to see if we can get some kind of measure of the quality of staff we're recruiting. We might want to look at the cost of poor quality work. Just look at those performance measures to get a sense of whether these reinforcing loops are out there and are strong in the system that we are working in. Because then we might want to intervene and cut these loops away because that tells us that reducing pay rates might not work. Questions? Okay. I, th I thought you were all asleep. Right. <coughs> Epidemics. Here's what else we do. Uh, now, here comes the really exciting bit. Let's see if we can get the technology to work. Right. I told you we were going to talk about the epidemic model. And here is an epidemic model. Those of you at the back, can you read the writing on that? I think you can't. Good for you. Good for the person who shouted no. The one person who talks in lectures has the lecturer's complete attention. Okay. Right. Is that any better? Thanks. Right. I've given you a somewhat a more complex model here. There are susceptibles. There are infectious people who have it but don't know they've got it people who are actually sick and then recovered. Uh, if we didn't call them recovered but called them removed or something, this could be HIV where the infectious period can be very long. It could be some other kind of disease. It's a more complex model. Okay? This is a model, as I've called it, in that it's not terribly dressed up, but you can get normal people to build this stuff. I've worked with people in a London hospital to build models of this nature about an accident in the emergency department and the flow of patients. I think I do now have to zoom out, but I think it'll be okay if you're familiar with these boxes, because what I can do is show you, actually no, I will stay zoomed in. Let me see if I can adjust my model, because you might enjoy it. So, why don't I see if I can pull in, talk to me, thank you. So if I pull susceptibles in and recovered, you've got the lot. Right. Okay, let's run the model. This is like water in a bathtub, and here it's kind of like four bathtubs all linked together. What happens is we start off... Talk to me. We start off with everybody in the susceptibles, then they flow through into the infectious, into the sick, and into the recovered. This is an epidemic. Everybody gets this. Since we've called them recovered, I guess this is just like a cold. Okay? You're infectious for a few days, sick for a few days, then you're recovered. Let's do it again. Notice these little things here, which are also giving you an idea of scale. They're like speedos yeah, in a car, speedometers. Okay, so watch the, way, watch the way the infection rate goes up. The falling sick rate goes up. The recovery rate goes up. Okay, now, of course, a better way of doing this is to look at some graphs. People like animation. Uh, it works quite well for them. Talk to me. Here we go. Right. 
What you see there is the susceptibles in red coming down as we create infectious people. model as we look at this and go this is this is not good um, what would happen if we reduce the transmission probability this is the chance that at each meeting with someone who's got a cold and someone who hasn't got a cold the chance that the disease is conveyed okay we can go in we can find the number that we've got which I believe is 0.3 and I think if we go 0.2 or no if we halve that something quite interesting will happen if we can find the half button. Okay, we'll go on five instead. Okay, let's try this. Well, oh, it's just happening later, but it's the same thing, isn't it? It's just been delayed a bit. No, hang on, this is different. take it down even further if we take it down to point one. experiments you can rigorously do in a model. Now, <clears throat> can you all sort of grab hold of something fairly firm at this moment? Not the person sitting next to you, your chair, okay? Because underneath all of this stuff is the equations. If you can't read them, that's probably best for you. Uh, but there they are. This is calculus, okay? These are differential equations, numbers, friendly algebra as we like to call it. We describe it as friendly because we write these long variable names. You'll notice that none of these variables is called X subscript 17, right? They're called things like infectious, daily contact rate, sick period, things you can understand. Now, this is the non-dressed up version of a model. As my last example, what I'd like to do is show you a micro world, which is a more dressed up, front-ended version of a model. And this is about movies. This is currently a topic of research of mine about how one markets good movies and indeed bad movies. And my conceptualization of this system is <coughs> we have a potential audience, which is just us, and they get interested, they get information about the movie. Okay? Um, so this is what we're 
they then view them. So they make the theory of the interest and mood not come out, but people know about it. Okay? So you are beginning to know about Spider-Man 2. But we can still answer some interesting questions using it. If we go to the model, it looks like this. This has got a slightly more sophisticated front end. Underneath it is a model, which looks quite big, and it's got even more equations underneath it. There you go. I did this with someone from a Hollywood studio. And we built this, and he understands it. It took us a long time to build it, uh, for, for us both to understand it, but he does. Um, we can move around this using these little buttons. I think I'm going to zoom in, because I want to show you what we can do with this. I'd like to do something which I understand is quite easy. I'd like to make a bad movie, and I'd like to try uh, marketing it. Well, what happens here, let me just run this. Um, everybody is the potential audience. Okay, and we are advertising this thing for 20 days. Okay, and what you can see is that over that period, um, uh, about a, a third of the potential audience has turned into people who are interested. They're going, oh, this, this sounds like it could be good fun. Yeah, um, yeah, I want to see Brad Pitt as Achilles or whatever. Yeah, and then at day 20, the movie is released and people go to see this thing. And I've just wiped out the animation. That's a pity. That's, here we go. Look at what's happened. Lots of these, well, some of these people have gone into the viewed and talking category, except what they're saying is, it's dreadful. Don't go to see it. As a result of which, members of the potential audience are becoming uninterested. There's a turning off rate. And even the interested people are losing interest. The thing to do is to look at this speedo, but you probably can't see it. Let's look at the... Notice how interested is getting more and more full. We are still moving on. It's day 48 now. But essentially, we've, people have stopped coming to see this film. Most everybody who was potential has become uninterested. Now, this is not the way you would operate this model. I wanted to show you it had the same kind of structure as the previous one. Let me just stop this. Oh, it stopped. Okay. You would operate this from here, and here you can now see the graphs. You press run, and there it is. You get people who are interested, the green, then you release the movie, and you create the pink line, people who have viewed the film and are talking about it. And instantly, you get this black line, people who are uninterested. Okay? Total viewings at the end are the red line. Now, what you can do with a micro world is you can help a normal person experiment with this model. They can, for instance, change the number of screens that this film is shown at. Have you noticed that in America, movies appear on sometimes a thousand screens, sometimes two thousand? Anybody know what happened on movie-wise on November the 5th last year? Matrix? Yeah, Matrix actually, the third one, Matrix Revolutions, uh, was released at the same time everywhere on the planet. First time it's been done. All right. All right, well, let's increase then the number of screens. We're only modeling a little city here. I've got my eye on the time, by the way, Michael. We only had 20 screens. I'm going to actually raise this to 100 screens, which I can do just by moving this slider. Okay? Look at where the red line was. In fact, I can see see the value of the red line in that it ended up as uh, seven, uh, 176,000. Look at the red line. Let's run it again. It's gone up. It was 176,000. It's now about 260,000. We've actually got more people to see this film, and we can explain it in terms of a causal theory. We actually got lots of people interested, and then we tried really fast to suck them into the cinemas to buy their ticket before word got out that this film was bad. 
Is this the explanation for the marketing strategy in Hollywood? You may think so. I couldn't possibly comment. We can also do things with successful films. We can return. We can click this, which is a U-turn, to go back to the original value. Remember, we had that for a bad film. Uh, we can try putting in a good film. Let's put in a good film. We get something quite different. Essentially, the black line vanishes. Yeah, pretty much everybody goes to see this film because it's a good film. People come out and say good things about it. We can increase the advertising budget. We can, which is this thing here, advertising spend. We could delay the release. We could have a longer marketing period. Now, there are all sorts of interesting questions which you can begin to analyze with a model like this. And with this kind of interface that you can move around fairly easily, change graphs, do all sorts of things, you can get normal people to do this kind of stuff. Now, I need to close. So, that was my marketing strategy. Now, let me just end. What does it offer as a simulation approach? Visually and functionally, I don't think system dynamics is really um, as impressive as some of the other stuff you're going to see today, some of the other stuff that my colleagues in the operational research community build. But what it does is this. First of all, it brings calculus, maths, equations to normal people. I suspect that you are normal. I'm pretty certain that I'm not, and neither are my students, and I always tell them that. But it gives people an opportunity to explain why a system has behaved in a problematic way. It can explain things. It helps them create and agree policies which will generate improved behavior. And it does all of these things in terms of system structure. People are giving coherent arguments about why certain consequences will flow. They're doing it in terms of system structure. And that is all. I wish to say. Yes, of course. Can we have some light? Is that so I can see them? Could we have some light, perhaps, just to see whether there are some brief questions now? Anybody like? I found your presentation highly interesting. I was uh, wondering uh, about one question, like uh, the model of the, um, the epidemic, the yeah. epidemic model. Um, how would you, how do you compare it to um, real-world uh, data, and how, how do you get a, um, a kind of idea of, of how this mod model actually reflects what's what's really happening in the world? Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's okay. The question was, how do we, how do we make a model like the epidemic model reflect what's really going on in the world? Well, that's that's not, a question. Not to predict, but Sorry. somehow to verify if it's relevant. To how do we verify whether it's relevant? <laughs> well, the validation of models is, is essentially a question of building confidence in the minds of the people who are using the model. Sorry, I'm trying to turn this off for you. Right. Uh, a model is a good model if the parameters in it are consistent with other data that you've got, if the structure, the causal hypothesis, is consistent with our belief for, of what is going on in the system. So we believe that to catch a cold, a susceptible has to meet an infective, so we need that mechanism going on. A model is also a good model if it reproduces, or another way of adding confidence to a model is if it reproduces any observed behavior. Okay. This is good scientific stuff. However, remember, all models are wrong. Some models are useful. Right? The, the, the way of pushing this point is the map is not the territory. Uh, Steve Wright, an American comedian, describes how he and his wife thought they would go on holiday to Canada one summer, so they bought a map of Canada, and the scale of the map was one to one. Right? As he puts it, we didn't go on holiday, we spent the summer looking at the map. All right? a, map is a, a map leaves out most of what's out there but puts in the stuff that's important for you to answer your question. I think that's another thing about a model. You never ever model a system. You model a question. And you build the model that you need to address that question for a particular group of people.
but there is a rich body of literature about one, how one validates such models in a, uh, in a rigorous scientific way. Yeah? You said it was not always good to uh, have a model that's too complex. What, how do you decide when you stop putting in or stop putting in an amount of complexity into the system and just say you'll run with a <coughs> simpler system? What do you, how do you know what to leave out? Well, it, it's, it's a question. This is why I, I tend not to use the term validation to describe getting a model right, partially because you can't get models right, but about confidence building. Right? Because confidence building then means you're doing it for a particular group of people. Okay? Who asked me this question? Was it? Yes, I, it is you were looking at. Um, so let me give you my, my, my favorite counterexample, which is reservoir simulation. So if you, you do geological survey of the bottom of the North Sea, you have complex three-dimensional maps of what's down there. You simulate how to get the oil out. So you've got four-dimensional simulation models, three spatial dimensions and one time dimension. The senior managers in oil companies hire really clever people to build really complex models to give them the answer where to, where to drill. Okay, and they believe those people and they accept their recommendations. So in that sense, in that case, having big models is good and appropriate. But if I'm sitting with the management team of a startup company, they're not going to let me listen to them for a few hours, go away, build my own model and come back to them and say, you should do this. I need to find a way of building a model with them to represent their ideas. Right, so that they can then play with the model, which, what happen, which is what happens when it works, and they can get learning from it. And I think learning is the key point here. You can work with people and build quite big models. It just takes time. And you'll be surprised how much a team of people can get from quite a small model, because people make mistakes about the behavior of these systems when they're really quite small. I was just wondering, um, how, do you, how do you deal with or how do you strategize um, vicious circles to become a blessing? That is, how do you use some kind of mutation in the system or strategi strategi strategize it in a way that it becomes useful for you? For example, if you know that people are put off by a certain movie, um, they get um, not interested in a movie, but then if they are so put off from the movie, they actually arouse, arouse the curiosity um, for the other part of the audience. So then more people go and see the movie. This is the so showgirls scenario, isn't it? <laughs> A movie so bad it's good. Yeah. yeah. So how, how do you make, I mean, in your field of operation, how do you take <coughs> advantage of that to modify the model in such a way that when it mutates, if you may, you actually strategize it or make it profitable for you? Okay. Nice question. In that when you started asking it, I, my mind immediately snapped to an answer, and I now think that that's not the right answer because you made me think, so thank you. Um, my first wrong answer um, is, is this. Whether, some, whether a reinforcing loop is a virtuous circle or a vicious circle is very much in the, mind, in the eye of the beholder. Right? So you know, if a revolutionary group does things that gathers more people to the revolutionary group, the revolutionaries would say that that is a virtuous circle. Presumably to the government who doesn't like this sort of thing, that's a vicious circle. And that's just simply a question of, well, Weltanschau and worldview, you know, your values. Um, <coughs> that's very often the case. Can you turn a vicious circle uh, to the good? Well, yes, if you can find that it has some other knock-on effects, um, I guess you can, you, because you can, this is quite subtle, isn't it? I, can, I, I, I remember, simply because it was on television recently, though I've never seen it, um, the Demi Moore film, Strip Tease, which I think was supposed to be, you get to see Demi Moore wearing very little clothes, which didn't do terribly well. Sorry? Yes, I, I saw it in the, uh, the Radio Times, which I remember they shifted the advertising campaign on, saying, no, oh, no, it's a comedy, or it's a comedy thriller, and you shouldn't take it seriously. Now, that's possibly attempting to break the vicious circle because you, of, of, I can't take this seriously, it's preposterous, and move elsewhere. Um, I'm not sure that you can consciously create a showgirls effect, the thing that's so bad it's good, or people go to see something because it's so bad. That's a, that's a very interesting point. I think the sort of 
that sort of insight is something that I could not bring as a system dynamicist. I think the management team would have to go, well, yeah, David, that is really, really bad, but, you know, we could do this because there are some other consequences. And one of the big things about the pitch that I make is I am not the expert in your system. I am supposed to be an expert in a way of thinking that will help you do better with your system. So that's the kind of contingent local knowledge that I would never have. I could always say, so is there anything we can do about this and try to help them create some ideas? Great question. Thank you. I, I'm, I fear I'm taking too much time, Michael. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take more questions. Another, Michael. One, one more question. Um, the origin of uh, system dynamics, we, or at least we tend to think of, it comes from kind of the physical sciences and um, yes. kind of wartime cybernetics and uh, weapons and so forth. When you're modeling human behavior, which is um, axiomatically much less predictable, do you have uh, any behavioral model? Mm. Right. Uh, yeah. This uh, is purely observational. Yeah. Uh, this this particular field was developed in the 1950s by Forrester, and its its roots in uh, the physical sciences, as it were, is in servo mechanistic theory. Um, Jay, Jay was an electrical engineer. Um, so uh, there, there are two parts to that answer. How do we deal with individual human beings? Right. One, we don't. We build models which operate at a very aggregate level. So we are not, I mean, there's a great chapter in Forrester about this. He says, we are not modeling individual psychology. However, we are modeling decisions. And he contrasts the sort of psychological view, which is too detailed, with the economics view, which simply imagines decisions are being made somewhere, and these have certain outcomes, i.e. The market, the market must clear, it must equilibrate. And system dynamics go, now somewhere between the two is the notion that decisions are being made with a certain pattern from pieces of information. There will be noise around that, but people collect information and try to, try to make decisions. So aggregation means that we don't get, I was going to say stuck in the mud, we don't get involved in those other interesting issues. Um, the second thing is there, is, there certainly is a model of human decision making which is essentially Herbert Simon's bounded rationality. There are reasons why people don't, you can't collect pieces of information or don't use them, choose to ignore them, or can't influence other people with information. Our models do not conceptualize the human agents within them as being rational economic man, looking at all information sources and optimizing across it because people don't do that. They just don't, and behavioral decision theory tells us that they don't, which is why Kahneman got the Nobel, Nobel Prize for Economics in late 2003, if you remember, late, late 2002, in fact. He's a behavioral decision theorist, and his ideas feed into system dynamics model. Is that something like a decent answer? Okay. All right. Helen. Um, I, I just wondered if you're doing this commercially by your client, if you're actually employed by a company who want to save money, for instance, and pay less administrators and take on less heads, if they want you to produce a certain model, that's the sort of, sort of problem. Right. Um, well, I used to be a management consultant for Shell International for three years. Um, one of the pleasures of being an academic is that I can walk away. So in a, in a sense, that's both a more important question and a less important question for me. I have the power to walk away. Uh, yes, I do do this stuff commercially in a consulting mode, but I don't need to. I do research and teaching at the LSE. Well, it depends what an organization wants to do. I mean, if they want to examine how to cut costs and they have an idea that they can do that by cutting pay rates, I can go in neutrally. Um, and help them examine the effects of that. I guess you're asking me the question, how would I feel if my model indicated that cutting pay rates was the right thing? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it, what I would do is certainly I would say to, them, say to the team, look, if you're absolutely wedded to this approach, to, to, to this course of action, cutting pay rates, then you don't need me because you're not going to listen to any counter evidence that I might elicit from you. And you need to understand that's what this process is going to be about. So there's that point. But secondly, you seem to be asking me the more personal question. How would I feel if no, I got an answer that I didn't like? No, I'm, more, I'm more skeptic how the modelling might be set up by, by the questions you're being asked. Right. Because the problem is right. getting to the wrong, <coughs> of you're producing the wrong answer. Really. 
Right. Yes, this is sort of using, using this is consultant as hired gun, so being brought in to actually support a, the course of action that's already been decided upon. I think you just simply have to have it out with the team that this is about not making assertions that are unsupported by arguments and data, but actually sitting there saying, I think that this will happen because A influences B influences C, and mapping that out in a model in a, an unambiguous way so your colleagues on the management team, as I have seen happen, look at one of these connections and go, but that's rubbish, it's not as strong as that, so that isn't what's going to happen. So we have to agree that that's the nature of the discourse that's going to take place. And if you don't want to do that, if you want to steer your organisation by gut feel, or you want to listen to members of staff because they have the right sign of the zodiac, then um, I'm not going there. But if you're interested in having a rational discourse of this nature, um, then I'm there and I can help, I can encourage them along the way to be more rational. They get used to this kind of discourse as we do it. And really quite normal people can do this. It's really quite surprising. There is a question there if you want me to take it. Um, my, my question is, when you build a model like, a, like the movie model, yeah. do you actually incorporate your model into the model? So in other words, if somebody's in the movie thing and, and they're following your model, then people are going to catch on that they're like hyping bad movies ahead of time. So it's going to decrease the effectiveness of the advertising over time. So do you have to incorporate the effect of modeling something within the model itself? Yeah, that's an interesting question, isn't it? <coughs> let's, let's, let's briefly examine the loop, that, the particular loop that you're explaining there. <coughs> it's a kind of multi-generational. If, if there are lots of movies that come along with great advertising and they prove to be rubbish, you would expect the variable, which is something like attention given to advertising, to go down over time. Right? Interesting. That's a different model. I could. The question is, though, is your, does the fact that people are using your model is going to actually change? Is actually going to change the model itself? Like, would you? Include, yes, yeah. but but what I'm trying to say is, first of all, that is an insight that you could get from using this model without explicitly modeling it. Right? You could say people are just going to get disaffected with advertising. They appear not to have, or at least those who do maybe have made the decision. You know, I, mean, I just read lots of reviews and I know that advertising tells me nothing. Right? Other than I think Brad Pitt would make a very good Achilles in principle. Um, but we might look at that model and go, well, actually we want to push this further to answer the question if, if we keep using advertising in this kind of undercut way. Will that change people's attitude to advertising? In which case, we are putting another feedback effect on the model, and we are building a model of a different issue. Notice, right? When you build these things, not only does the model change as you introduce more assumptions, um, but the issue that you're looking at changes. <coughs> I think a final observation about that, it, I think Da Vinci once said, no, no work of art is ever finished, it is merely abandoned. That's true of models. Right? The deliverable is not the model, it's the learning that comes from working with the model. Um, I think Umberto Eco says, all, tru all truths worth knowing are instruments to be thrown away. Right? It's good to throw the model away, having got the learning, the new insight, and the commitment to action. I think we better stop, haven't we? <laughs>